with God's word. They want God's word to line up with their insanity. Like I just was sent a video. I'm, I'm not on social media, um, but uh, the, the Duke University School of Divinity. Anybody see this? Oh. I mean, okay. Before I knew Christ, I was a heathen. All right? Plain and simple. I never took God's name in vain. I used a lot of other adjectives. Are they adjectives? I don't know. I never took God's name in vain, even though I was a heathen child, because something about taking God's name in vain just didn't seem right. Plus, there were so many other words to use. Even as a heathen, I knew there were some lines that should never be crossed. But the Bible talks about abominations. When idols, and this has nothing to do with my sermon, well it does. When idols, ungodly idols, are brought into the house of God. That it's an abomination. You watch this video, it's about three and a half minutes long. I've been told it's all over social media. It's Duke University School of Divinity. And you got this young woman, she says her name, she's a, I remember she's a second year divinity student. And she's welcoming everybody to this worship space. And she's going on and on. And she refers to God, the very first thing, she refers to God as queer. They pray. They pray to God as transgender. They pray to God as a whole bunch of other things that just made me want, and people are applauding. And they're here to worship this one that has no pronoun. And they call her her and a thing or I, I, I it's horrible. Horrible. Folks, people, and this is in the Methodist Church. They're at the Duke University. Not at the college I want to start. What's the matter you? <laughs> We'll never have something like that at Duke University where these people are going to step behind pulp pulpits and proclaim a false gospel to ears that are willing and itching to hear it. We must look into this life with eyes of faith. Lining up our lives to the Word of God, not lining up the Word of God to our lives. So we've been looking at this thing called faith, and I'm telling you now more than ever before in my entire Christian life, and in my, my natural life too, which now I'm a Medicare uh, uh, recipient. Yeah, yeah, woo woo! Yeah, got my card. Boy, they send you your Medicare, it's paper. I had to laminate my own card. What kind of nonsense is that? Yeah. I shouldn't have? <gasps> Why? Tell me later. No, that's my way of standing up against the machine. Anyway, so. <laughs> but the thing is, faith has to be more aware in the forefront of every believer's life today. Because guess what? You're going to find out where your faith really is. So we started to look at how many uh, walk up to the line of faith. But they, that's as far as they go. They don't step over into faith. They talk about it, but they don't. We left off with, uh, with 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Verse number 9, and let me read to you as this. It says this. If, and this is Jehoshaphat's praying this prayer. If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. Bang! Bang! Right there is truth. Jehoshaphat is standing in front of the nation of Judah. And he is proclaiming, not with a question, but a, a, a determination that God will be there no matter what. It, whether they go through famine or sword or pestilence or whatever, God is going to be there. Now we move on to verses 10 and 11. This is where we pick up. And let me read them to you and then I'll explain them to you. But now here we are, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territories you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. Get, uh, get that clear in your head. There's enemies that they were not allowed to invade to fight against. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. 
see how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. So basically what happened, the enemy was all around. Israel went out to fight them. God said, leave them alone. Yeah, but they're the enemy. Nope, nope, leave them alone. Go back home. Israel went back home. Now the same people that they went out to fight against and they would have overcome are now coming to Judah to overtake them. Now why would God let stuff like that happen? I've, I really pondered that because let me explain it to you. First of all, God had to plan, as he always does, to use the circumstance to chasten and remind a nation that their dependency must be upon the Lord. God does use circumstance to keep people dependent on him. It is so important, vitally important, especially in today's world, that we understand that circumstances are used by God to keep us dependent upon the Lord. We recently, uh, you know, well, two and a year and a half ago or whenever, our economy was just going gangbangers. It was just wham, it was just all out, it was yahoo. 401ks were growing. People's incomes were growing. Inflation was down. Everything's great. Our country, I felt, was really starting to get, especially the church, was getting more man-dependent than ever before. And you're like, oh. But he was, you know, President Trump was a good president. I would agree. He did a lot of great things. Some things I could have done without. But he did a lot of great things. Then COVID came while he was still president. Handled it best as anybody could, right? Never seen something like this before. And now we have inflation over 8%. We have gas prices that are never been so high. And I remember the 70s when it was rationed, and we might be getting to that again. Baby formula. For parents, families not to get baby formula? It, it's, it's horrible. All this kind of stuff. See, I look at it this way. What is God stripping away from us? What God is stripping away from us is our dependency upon ourselves. Some people say, I don't know what else to do but pray. <laughs> when you say stuff, and I've said stuff like that. When, when, when you say stuff like that, just hit yourself in the head with whatever is nearby. Just take something and just ding yourself. Ball peen hammer works really well. <laughs> Seriously, it's stripping us of what? Our dependency upon man, and it's putting us back to our faith in God. See, God uses circumstance. He was using these enemies because Judah had become and was becoming more and more self-dependent, self-reliant, than they were becoming God-dependent and God-reliant. Faith Real faith requires absolute dependency on God. Non-faith or pseudo-faith or pretend faith or faith just simply walking up to the line faith requires no faith at all. You can say all day long, I took a step of faith. Did you or did you ever step over into faith? See, verse 10 and 11, which I just wrote, read must bring us to verse number 12 and it reads as this oh our God will you not judge them question mark now again this is a rhetorical question that again up in the beginning of verse was it the verse number six when he started his prayer oh Lord God our, our fathers are you not the God who is in heaven question mark these aren't questions like, oh, will he help us oh is he the God no these are a proclamation that Jehoshaphat knows who he is, knows he's the God, and knows who he's praying to. So we have to get that in our heart. So he says, O oh our God, will you not judge them? Question mark, for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. See, now think about it. God always has a purpose. Granted, some things, some calamities, we bring upon ourselves by poor choices. 
Sometimes God gets blamed for things he had nothing to do with. He said, you just made a bad, bad choice. If you eat sugar all your life and one day your pancreas goes on to blink, well, guess what? It's not God's trying to chasten you. You should have knocked off eating all the sugar. You drink all the time, your liver gets fatty and cirrhosis, and you go, why did God do this to me? God had nothing to do with it. All the alcohol you consumed did it to you. If you jump out in front of a truck on, on the interstate, and you get hit and killed, and you stand before God, you go, God, why would you let that happen? Because he's like, you're a moron. You jumped in front of a truck. See, we do bring stuff upon ourselves, but I'm talking about there are situations that are out of our control. And i got to be honest with you, I, I read a lot, I hear a lot, I, I watch a lot, and I see so many things that are out of our control right now. That, really. Okay, uh, granted, we can vote, and you should vote in the primary in June. Then you should vote in November. I'm telling you, as a Christian, as a believer, you should vote. Whether, again, <clears throat> you vote the way I would have voted, or the way you're... But the point is, vote. But there's so many things. Whether elect, the, the election goes the way I think it should or not, things are out of control. We have no control over it. Now, what do you do? Do you freak out? Do you curl up in a, in a corner and suck your thumb and get your safe space? What do you do? What you do is you put your faith and your trust in God as they did. He says right here, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Lord. <clears throat> See, in the area of faith, God knows that the faith of his children must grow and develop so that their lives can be display for all to see the power of God. In a person's life, the power of God should be the thing that's displayed more than anything else. So the question begs, and if you've got any thoughts on it or whatever, if you want to find out where you stand, ask somebody that you know. Walk up to somebody, maybe a co-worker, maybe a fellow student, maybe a neighbor, and just say this. It's kind of random. They might freak out a little bit. And, and ask them, do you know that I'm a Christian? Listen to what they say to you. They might go, yeah. We, we, yeah. They might go, you are? Whew, would that hurt or what? You, 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 you're a Christian. I'm just saying, throw it out there. What, what, why? Because faith and, and chast, chastening and all these things shape us, and God wants to grow faith in his children. We, we taught our kids all sorts of things. Why? Because we wanted them to learn. I get to teach our grandchildren certain things that I, I see I want them to learn. Their parents teach our grandkids things. They want to see them learn. We're teaching. Why? So they grow. Why do I pastor this way? Why do you and I do this? Because we want to see you grow in your faith, in your belief, in your hope, in your strength. Why? Because the day's coming. The enemy is literally standing right outside of the city. And if you don't stand in faith, you will crumble within the walls of church and God. See, what this does, this combats what I see today. What I see today, and this is kind of stinging, is I see an arrogance of believers. It's more of a self-serving display of self-indulgence, wanting and believing that they deserve all blessings without any struggle at all. That's what I see. I see preachers proclaim it. I see churches applaud it, where they want the, everything to be their way. Every, they get everything they want, and so they deserve it. I, early on, way back when, when I, when I was a new Christian, but then when I went into ministry... And my first missions trip was in 1984, and I went to Haiti. Nick was with me, and we went to Haiti, spent 12 days there. I've spoken about it many times. It was a life-changing event because we went, from, we went all over that country. We were in the rural areas that were better, and we were in the worst of the worst of the worst areas. Life-changing. But when we had church that Sunday morning, the first Sunday we were there, church was packed. Dirt floor, cement walls, tin roof, benches sitting on cinder blocks. Packed. 
had to be 100 degrees and 200% humidity. You know, your skin's just leaking all over the place. And those people were there, and to hear them worship, baby, that's heaven, man. Hands raised up, it was heaven. Mom nursing a child on the second row. It was just, it was just weird, but amazing. So I get home, and where I was a youth pastor, a preacher came in, an evangelist came in, and started talking about how blessed God wants every believer to be. I'm like, amen. I agree 100%. But then he defined his blessing. His blessing was things. His blessing was a bank account, a car, a house, success, reputation. I'm sitting there going, because I had more culture shock coming home than I did going to Haiti. Just want you to know. I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm sitting on the platform, you know, with all the other pastors. I'm supposed to behave myself. And I had a suit and tie on, which was probably good. Although I started getting lightheaded because the veins in my neck were starting to bulge out of my shirt. And I, it was hard to breathe. I was so sickened that I went right up to that guy after church. Said, yo, are you serious? He called me brother. I said, whoa, I ain't your brother. Oh, yes, you are. No, no, not your brother. No, no, because we don't see the same way. We're not from the same family. You mean to tell me the place that I just came from, those people aren't blessed because they're sleeping in sewage? Now, granted, would I want to take every one of them out of the sewage and the corruption of that country? Of course. But see, it didn't matter. Why? Because they had faith. Faith was so much more important than things. And we're in this American mentality that church and Christianity should be all this fluff and all these things and all these frills and all this stuff. And I'm here to tell you, God doesn't care one thing about that. I believe the only reason God gives us wealth is to give it back to his kingdom. To further the kingdom of Jesus Christ around the world. The more you have, the more you should give. The less you have, the more you should give. Why? Because everything you have has been given by the hand of God and is to be returned back to him. Why? So that the gospel of Jesus Christ can go forward. What does that do for you? It increases your faith. It kicks you out of yourself. Have you ever gotten into yourself? Anyone? Anyone? I have. I hate when I get into myself. I'm thankful early on people like you're into yourself. Now I kind of realize it. Now I'm like, I'm into myself. You know what I'm saying? You, you know what I'm talking about? It's like, ah, me, 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 okay? Me, 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 me. Was that on key? I think it was. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not about us. It's about God. God wants to grow this in every believer's life. It was a good thing that, that Jehoshaphat said this to the people and to God. We're scared. We don't know what to do. But what we will do is keep our eyes on you. Okay, I'm, telling you, I'm not telling you to put a blind eye to the things going on around you in the world. N n not at all. In fact, you should be looking through the eyes of faith, seeing God's plan and purpose through it all. But the fact is, it's not a bad thing. For example, God wants to display what it is for a believer to struggle. Now again, I know that goes against modern Christianity, especially in the United States. But scripturally, I can prove it. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse number 9. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. And he says this. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. 
We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels, as well as to human beings. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 9. It seems like to me God has put us apostles on display at the end of the processional. Now, see, Paul's addressing something. What Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, he's exposing them. He's exposing the fact that they walked up to the line of faith. They look good, but they've never stepped into faith. But everyone around him goes, oh, it looks good. Looks good. Doesn't that look good? I used to rehab homes. Look good on the outside. Till you like, oh, you know that toilet, it looks like maybe it was leaking. Maybe I'll take the toilet off. Oh, look, I can see the ground. That piece of linoleum they stuck down there keeps you from seeing the ground. So what do you do? You re-glue the linoleum and move on. <laughs> no. No, you got to rip it out. Looks good though. Looks good. See, Paul's exposing the Corinthian church for what they really are. Arrogant and self-reliant, dependent upon their own wealth and reputation. The church in Corinth was that way. Self-sufficient, man-made, pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, have made a, a name for ourselves. That's who we are. Yahoo, look at us. And they say, oh, God has blessed us. God has blessed us. But for reals, that wasn't happening at all. And Paul decided to call him out. Paul is attempting to direct the church away from the worldly approval and self-sufficiency and bring them back to faith and dependency in Christ. I'm going to read that to you again. Paul is attempting, attempting. Uh, men's night we had this past Monday. I'll remind me where I just left off. Men night, men's night this past Monday was awesome. Love getting with, together with the guys. By the way, guys, we're planning on one in June. Love to have you. I know some of you couldn't make it, but it was a great time. But I shared out of the book of Acts, uh, last chapter, chapter 28, I believe, verse 24. Is there 28 chapters in the book of Acts? I think so. Anyway, it's the last chapter, but I'm pretty sure on verse 24. As they write, the Acts of the Apostles write, they said, after they have preached, some will believe and some won't. Some will believe and some won't. Well, what does that mean? It means some people go, yep, I'm taking that step. I'm going to... Step into faith. Others will be like, nope, I'm good right here. Close enough to resemble it, but far enough not to have to do anything with it. God is pushing us to the place of what will you do? He's preparing us. The last days are coming. He's preparing his church to stand strong until the church is raptured and taken out of this world. And how many churches will be empty because of the rapture? And how many like this Duke University divinity, blasphemous organization will be filled with people celebrating the queer, transgender, sexually fluid, whatever else they said, higher power. And people will flock there for the answers. And then they'll be like, why are you here? And why are others, ha why are they gone? See, it's faith, man. So let me, I want to hurry. So Paul's trying to direct them to get away from worldly approval and self-sufficiency. Got to be honest with you. We've had people leave this church. People have said to me, here's the reasons why I'm leaving this church. Okay. I don't know if they're shocked if I don't go, please stay. Please. Please. I'll just change. Just give me a chance. I'll change. I'll make it fit you. 
I'm like, okay. We're leaving. Oh, okay. We're going somewhere else. Okay, okay. I'm glad you're going somewhere else. I, I am. Good. Let's see how that works out. See, you can only attempt to give truth. As Paul was doing to the church at Corinth, he was attempting to give him truth. Why? To sway them away from the direction of being self-reliant and also from the place of seeking worldly approval. When the world applauds what a church is doing, I get nervous. You know what I'm saying? When the world applauds what a church is doing, I get a little nervous. Now granted, there's some things that churches will do in the name of God that the world will be like, wow, like the food boxes. But nobody knows except the social workers that we do that, which is fine. But they're like, wow, that's pretty awesome. But when the church as a whole is getting the applause of the world, I get nervous. That's just me. Now I can say I'm officially old. Well, tomorrow I am. I'm old. I can say whatever I want. It's just going to get worse. That's what everybody told me. Oh, Steve, wait till you get your Medicare card and you laminate it. And although I wasn't allowed, and you turn 63, you can say whatever you want. Everybody will be like, ah, he's just old. I've been doing that for 40 years. I just old. Morons. Oh, I'm so looking forward. That's going to be my favorite word. Oh, wait, it already is. <laughs> Quickly, because we got communion. By the way, if you're at home, just pause this or pause it at the end and we're going to take communion. So it's interesting that Paul says, or, or, or yeah, Paul says, at the, the apostles are on display at the end of the parade, at the processional. Now that's important. People read by that. See, the putting the apostles at the end to be on display was the place of least recognition. In fact, those people that were going to be put into the arena to be martyred as prisoners were the ones that went at the end. So Paul says the apostles are put on display by God at the end of the processional to be displayed in front of angels and for men. So right here, the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, if you're looking for recognition, if you're looking for the applause of this world, you're looking in the wrong place. When you see what's going on, put your eyes, as Jehoshaphat did, put your eyes on God. Seek the kingdom of God first, right? And all these things will be added unto them. But when you seek the plans of man... There's no faith involved. Their lives are on display so others can see. See, the thing is, you can't fake this. When you take that step of faith, you cannot fake it. People will see that your life is different. What are you afraid of people seeing? You're going to fail. Sure, that's when you're, as a believer, you're going to go, ah, man, I failed. And people will see that and be like, oh, why why'd you say anything? You shouldn't have said anything. You didn't have to say anything. No, the thing is, we are to be put on display. Paul's letting the people know that serving Christ might possibly be the one thing that includes pain, sorrow, and loss instead of wealth and comfort. See, I go back to Haiti. I go back to the people in Haiti. Nick, remember when we went to the... Um, the market on that one Sunday afternoon, right there in Port-au-Prince. And we had a Canadian young girl, remember she, she took a year off, didn't go to uh, college, she had a basketball scholarship. She was given a year of her life to be a translator down in Haiti with the people that we were working with. Super nice girl. And she, since, you know, I only, I'm, only, I'm fluent in English and Spanish, uh, but not Cre Creole, which is a French der derivative, uh, even though I took four years of French in high school. What an absolute waste of time. <laughs> Absolutely. Oui, oui. <laughs> Survey something, yeah. 
So the thing is, this, I'll never forget, this mom came walking up to us with this emasculated child in her hands. Kid was about yo big. You could see every rib in that child's body. It actually looked fake to me. Face was just all sunk in. And she comes up to us and she's speaking in Creole. And she's holding that child out to me. And the girl that was our interpreter started crying. I said, hon, what, what did she say? She asked if we would take her baby back to the United States. I said, how old is this child? I thought it was maybe a month. Two and a half years old. So malnutrition. I didn't even know how that baby was still breathing. And I stood there knowing that I couldn't take that child. But yet that woman was a woman of faith. She said to us, God has been faithful. Now you try to tell me that us, that here, the church in America, that we are more blessed than that woman? When I discovered that that woman is more blessed than me, because she has faith, real faith, real understanding of what it is to know that as a believer, things might be horrible, but yet there's faith in God. So what do you do with that? What you do with it is it puts a fire in your soul, man. It puts a fire down inside of you that you don't want to go back to that old way, that apathetic way, that I deserve a way, that self-reliant way, self-indulgent way. You want to pour it out. You want to give until you can't give anymore. You want to serve until you can't serve anymore. You want to keep moving until your last very breath in the hopes that somebody might discover Jesus Christ in their life. That's the faith. That's the hope. That woman stepped across that line of faith. She brought shame to me. Our son was a year old. He's back at home with his mom. Clean diapers, clean clothes, food. But that woman had faith. And I swore that day that I want that faith. In the 40 some years I've been a Christian, I've had my pipes cleaned on numerous occasions. Tragedy has struck, pain and sorrow has been felt. But I consider it what? Pure joy. For it strengthens strengthens my faith in God. Lord, we look to you, God. You are truly, Father, the one in control. And we're truly the ones who have messed things up. Lord, I pray right now for those here, those at home, the God that you would speak to our lives. With your heads bowed for just a moment. I'm going to do a twofold thing. One, if you need to accept Christ in your life, I'm going to ask you to look at me in a minute. But along with that, and I think it's important that we do this. If you've walked up to that line of faith, but you just want to look good. But you don't really want 
up to this point to step into it because you know what's coming. We need to pray. You hear me? We need to pray. We need to pray that right out of your life. So how we're going to do it? Moment. Either way, I'm going to ask you to look at me. So starting on my right, look at me right now. Sure. Got him. Cool. My left. No matter which way it is. Sure. Yeah. Got him. All right. Pray along with me, Lord. Here I am. I'm putting my name down, Lord. I'm here for you. I don't know what to do, Lord. But I'm going to keep my eyes on you. God, walk me through this life. Walk me through my struggle. Walk me through my pain and my sorrow. I will not fall or wander away or resent. But I will draw near to you. Because God, I know that your love, your mercy is everlasting and everlasting. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray now that we prepare our hearts for communion. That God, that you bless this time as we're around your table. In Jesus' name, amen. How we do communion here, we do it according to the word of God. The word of God does not specify that only certain people, meaning a denomination, can take communion. I've been in churches where I'm not allowed to take communion because I'm not of that denomination. Okay. Here, we go by what the book says book says if you're right with God you can take communion the Bible says if you're not right with God don't take communion cut and dry and I can't make that decision for you guys are going to pass out the the emblems hold on to them remember there's two two lids on them once to open the wafer once to open the juice just so you know then once they got a beautiful song they're going to be singing for us once we're all done then I'm going to come up we're going to share it together nothing but the blood thank the Lord for the cross as we take of communion this morning, our salvation was paid for with a price that only God could pay. For the debt he didn't know, but we owed him, but he paid it all. This little wafer represents the broken body of Christ. It says that when Christ and the disciples were together at the Last Supper, that he took that loaf of bread and he raised it up and he broke it in front of his disciples Judas included and he says this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me I often wonder who he looked at when he said that you know my wife when she used to say things she was talking and sometimes she'd make on, eye contact with one of the kids I was just glad she wasn't making eye contact with me just wonder if he looked right at Judas it's one of the questions I have when I get there. Who'd you look at? Because see, to me it makes sense to look at Judas because Judas was the one that was so lost. But maybe he looked at Peter too. Because Peter thought he had faith until a few hours later and then he was like, oh, nuts. But he did this for us. What did Jehoshaphat said? I don't know what to do, but I'm going to keep my eyes on you and that's what Jesus did Lord Jesus we thank you for your broken body as we take this wafer we do this in remembrance of you let's take it together then the blood had to be shed so that the payment would be paid in full a blood vow a blood covenant that no man could ever pay. Christ did. He took that cup of wine, he lifted it before his father, and he says, this is the cup of my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That blood washes away a multitude of sin. Lord Jesus, thank you for the blood 
Thank you for sacrifice. I pray you bless it as we take it in Jesus' name. Let's take it together. Why don't you all stand? Let me close in prayer. If you got prayer, any prayer needs this morning, come on up here. There will be people up here who will be more than happy to pray with you. I want to invite you one more time to come to Tuesday Night Prayer. love to have you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we've had to be in your house today. As we leave here, Lord, I pray you bless us. Send us out into this lost and dying world. Take that message of hope. Give us strength, protection in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.